Hello and welcome to the third video that I've created. Um, as you know, these um, videos are for revision purposes for OCR Religious Studies Year 1 and AS. Um, the topic that we're going to look at today is the soul, mind and body. So we're going to actually look at some sort of you know, theological issues which we haven't previously looked at. Um, the first thing to say is that we previously looked at two philosophers, um, the first of which uh, the, or the first of who was Plato, who was a rationalist. Um, as you know, rationalism is the belief that you can find knowledge um, about the universe through thought alone. Um, the second was Aristotle, who's an empiricist, who believes that knowledge can be gained through observation of the world. Okay, so this um, topic is really to ask the question, what makes you, you? Now, that um, probably sounds a little strange um, for people who don't study philosophy, but hopefully it's one that you might have considered. Um, the first thing to say is that some philosophers believe um, that it could be your body, that actually your body and mind are one entity. Um, and as a consequence of that, basically, your body defines who you are. Um, that raises some interesting questions. For example, if you have a leg amputated, does that make you somewhat of a lesser person? Um, the second thought is, is it um, that you have a consciousness? Does that make you you? Um, again, there are some interesting questions that arise from that. We're all aware that we're conscious both of ourselves and others. Um, but is it consciousness which is the essence of you? Um, what happens if you suffer from dementia and you don't have the same consciousness as you once had? Does that make you less of a human being? Um, for someone with advanced dementia or Alzheimer's di disease, for example, um, who doesn't appear to have very much of a consciousness at all, does that make them less of a human being or indeed a human being at all? Again, some moral questions that you might want to think about. The third position is the mind-body question, whether you're a separate mind and a separate body. Um, again, we'll look at that in a little more detail um, as we go through the presentation. Um, one of the first things to say is that obviously many theologians would argue that the soul is a thing in itself. That the soul somehow exists separately from ourselves. However, there's not general consensus on this, and other theologians would say that the soul is not a specific thing in itself, but describes the whole person. As I've said, there's no clear consensus on this, and we'll find that there are different positions. So don't worry too much about thinking whether there's a right or wrong answer to this question. There clearly isn't. So I said that we would go back and look at um, the philosophy of Plato and Aristotle. So first things first, here's Plato. Um, Plato is a dualist. Um, in essence, he believes that the mind and body are separate entities. Now, I said that empiricists um, study things from nature. That doesn't mean to say that rationalists wouldn't do the same. And Plato obviously observed throughout his life that there was decay in nature. You know, things rotted, decayed, got old, etc. However, he believed that our souls uh, are immortal. They have no beginning or end, and this was largely because um, they belonged to the realm of the forms. Um, the next thing that Plato thinks is that having been trapped inside our imperfect bodies, the soul has a wish or desire to leave, and as such, death is nothing to fear. You know, it's just simply our bodies decaying, but our souls will go on and continue living in someone else. Remember I said that he believed in reincarnation. It should be noted that Plato doesn't hold um, the, the Christian view that a soul is a gift from God. Plato's clearly not a Christian. Um, he's obviously uh, born before Christianity comes into existence. However, um, he is influential in his view to Christians that there is some perfect realm beyond the temporary imperfection of our mortal lives. So he is influential in that regard. The second philosopher that we looked at was Aristotle. Now you'll recall that we talked about 
um, Aristotle's four causes. Um, you may want to go back and have a look at that. But essentially, when it comes to the question of what makes you you, Aristotle believes that our flesh and bones are the material cause and that the soul is our formal cause. Again, as I say, you may want to go back and look at the four causes. And for Aristotle, when we die, the soul dies with us and we simply revert to a lump of matter. And however, he does say that the soul is more than just chemicals, physics, etc. It's the spark to our lives, but it isn't a distinct entity in the way that Plato thinks. For Aristotle, the soul has three aspects. He talks about a vegetative soul. This is shared by all living things. He then talks about an appetitive soul, if I can say that correctly, um, which are passions, appetites, emotions, desires, etc. Now he says that all living things, um, and he means, sorry, animals um, and humans have this appetitive soul. Plants obviously don't. The last thing he talks about is the intellectual soul. He says that this is possessed only by humans. Now, this is all you really need to know about Plato and Aristotle, but obviously they will reappear from time to time as we uh, as we go on. Now, this is someone who I haven't mentioned before, um, but obviously starts playing a key par uh, part in theology. So we're now going to skip to the 12th and 13th century um, with someone called St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, Aquinas basically revives Aristotelian philosophy and reaffirms the idea that the soul is not me, but requires a body to be complete. So he's essentially saying that the soul um, is the kind of spark to our bodies, that without that spark, we wouldn't be who we are. Now we'll go back and look at St. Thomas Aquinas in a lot more detail on a lot more topics, um, but on that basis, we, th we can move on. The next thing I'm going to talk about is substance dualism. Now, this is quite important. And again, you might want to do a fair degree of reading around this particular topic. So, so far, we've mentioned dualism. I mentioned briefly that Plato was a dualist um, and it's the idea that mind and body are separate. Um, I also want to just introduce a little topic here, which is called monoism. And that's the view that the mind and body are one entity. Now we will, as I say in, in this, look at this in more detail, but one objection is that it reduces humans to biological entities. If you look at, you know, things like amoebas, um, they simply kind of reproduce and do very little else. Um, those people who uh, criticize uh, monoism basically say, well, what's the necessity then, or what's the case um, for human flourishing? Um, in short, if we're simply biological entities, you know, mind and body being one thing, and that our aim in life is to reproduce in the continuation of the species, then there wouldn't be any real need for human flourishing at all. Um, in short, why would we need Mozart or Leonardo da Vinci if all we're going to do is replicate? However, as I say, we'll maybe come uh, back to that topic at a later date. Again, here's a philosopher um, that you're going to hear a lot more about, um, René Descartes. Um, René Descartes was a French philosopher who was a believer in substance dualism. Now that's a slightly subtle distinction from dualism in the sense that Descartes believes that the mind and body were two wholly different substances. Now Descartes a rationalist. He believes obviously that um, you can uh, gain knowledge of the world through thought alone. So Descartes, uh, Descartes pointed out that our senses are susceptible to mistake. Now, again, as I say, you'll come back to Descartes in future, but you may recall um, that Descartes believes um, that he may be deceived, or at least he talks about that he may be deceived by what's known as a malin genie, someone who's constructing the world around him and as a consequence of that, um, there are no solid foundations to his knowledge. Um, 
through um, one of his books, The Meditations, um, Descartes comes to the conclusion that the foundation of our knowledge rests in this maxim, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. So he seems to suggest that um, we can doubt our senses, we can doubt that our bodies actually exist, but the one thing that we can't doubt is that our minds actually exist. However, um, there are other views on the mind-body question. So in the 20th century, uh, a philosopher, an analytic philosopher, Gilbert Ryle, attempted to refute Descartes' substance dualism, and he describes it as the ghost in the machine. Uh, in his work, Ryle basically accuses Descartes of making what he calls a category error. Again, it's a key term, you might want to learn that. In essence, it's treating one thing as distinct and separate from the other. Now, Ryle gives three examples. These are three original examples. So there's potentially a, an exam question which might come up, which may well ask, give an example of Ryle's original um, concepts of category error. So you might want to uh, learn one or two of these. The one that I'm going to talk about is um, Ryle describing a person being taken um, to Cambridge. Um, having shown the visitor um, the different colleges, etc., um, you might think about showing them the library, um, the different colleges, the Fitzwilliam Museum, etc. Um, the visitor then asks, where's the university? Now for Ryle, they've made a category, uh, they've, sorry, they've made a category error. Um, they're looking around for the university um, because they don't believe um, that these individual com um, components constitute the university, but of course they do. Um, so please, as I say, have a look at the other examples. You may find those a little bit easier to understand than the one I've outlined here. Okay, the next philosophy that comes into this um, or philosophical idea is materialism. And materialism is the belief that human beings are simply their flesh, blood, nerves, etc. Um, so essentially, it should be a fairly easy philosophical concept to understand. You know, you are who you are because that's your physical presence. However, materialists are often less materialistic than the name suggests. Um, again, this is a name you'll come across quite a controversial um, figure, um, the biologist Richard Dawkins. Um, for anyone who's seen Richard Dawkins speak on TV, etc., read one of his books, you'll know that he's highly critical of religious believers. However, he does acknowledge the mystery of consciousness although he feels that research into DNA will reveal what the kind of secrets of consciousness are. Um, in his books, Dawkins talks of soul one and soul two. Um, soul one is the soul of traditional thought and that kind of religious sort of notion which uh, he uh, poo-poos, whereas soul two is a soul rooted in the body but capable of intellectual thought and higher order thinking. Again, you know, Dawkins isn't talking about this in some kind of mystical sense, but, but believes that this soul too will be discovered through research into DNA. So he suggests that it's part of the makeup, genetic makeup of human beings. And um, there's also the idea of behaviorism and behaviorists such as B.F. Skinner um, believe that what we consider to be mental events are simply learned behaviors. Um, Skinner points to the work of Pavlov and uh, Pavlov's famous dog. Um, now, if you're not sure what that is, um, Pavlov is a behaviorist. Um, he has a dog, um, which he feeds when he rings a bell. Um, he then does some experiments on the dog, for example, removing the dog's jaw, and finds that the dog still salivates and wants food when ringing the bell, despite lacking the capacity to eat the food. And he says that human beings, um, you know, respond um, to various um, things and that, you know, our behaviour um, is simply learned. 
Um, again, we might sort of consider how when we're sitting in a school, the bell rings and we know that it's time to leave the lesson or what the bell you know, means. Those are simply learned um, responses. Um, other philosophers take issue with this. Daniel C. Dennett um, considers that view to be oversimplistic. Um, he says that animals' wants or desires may be learned, but the same isn't true of humans. Um, for example, wanting to read um, a book may be explained by behaviorism. You know, it's a want or desire. But um, what we can't explain is wanting to read a book because I enjoy the author's other works. That seems to be um, a much more complicated sort of intellectual mode of behavior than behaviorists can adequately explain. OK, so we're at the end of this presentation uh, and just a sort of final thought, which is the objections to theories and conclusions. Um, this is a really complex area and the danger is that by presenting a sort of short video, I'm oversimplifying things. Even um, the most well established ideas um, are subject to questioning um, when we look at this particular topic. Again, we could look at the work of the scholar John Cottingham. Um, he's one of the foremost scholars in the world on Descartes' philosophy. And he's questioned the traditional assumption that Descartes is a dualist. In actual fact, Cottingham suggests that Descartes believes in trialism, uh, a system that identifies three substances, body, mind and spirit. So, as I've mentioned, um, there doesn't seem to be any clear consensus on this topic. You know, theologians and philosophers will argue it um, for a very long time to come. 